So last week we started to talk about Jesus calling us to follow him and he will make us fishers of men. So we want to follow Jesus this morning in some of the uh, illustrations when he encountered people and his disciples just like us were following him and as they were following him their mind changed and they were being equipped to become the fishers of men that Jesus wanted them to, to be. So the first scriptures, you know this one, maybe we can read it aloud together, uh, Mark 1, 17, and we will read it together. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Let's read it again. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. How about reading it again as, as a confession, like something that we want to stay with us. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. That's Jesus speaking to us. Follow me, I will make you become fishers of men. That's his desire for each and every one of us. Amen? Amen? Are you desiring what He desires for you? Yes. Okay. God here gives us the privilege. It's a privilege. He calls us to become something that we are not. He's doing a work in us and we are being changed and He's given us the privilege to participate into the plan of reconciliation and to uh, harvesting with Him. Jesus Christ came to give His life. He died to save the lost. He came to seek and save and you are the proof of that. You are here today because Jesus Christ came to die so that you and I can be here today and, and serve Him and know Him and be reconciled with the Father. And as He reconciled us to the Father and with Himself, He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Last week we compared our following Jesus as disciples as apprentice. We are apprentices. And we says an apprentice is one who is learning by practical experience under skilled workers, a trade, art, or calling. You are learning under a skill. Someone who knows what they are doing. They have done it before and you are learning along that person. There's a part of our apprenticeship that is our own responsibility. Jesus says, follow me. So my part is, I'm following you, Lord. And the part of Jesus, Jesus assumes also a role in our transformation, in our becoming a fisherman. He is now saying to us, I will make you, you follow me, that's your part, and me, I will do the job. I will transform you. The Holy Spirit uh, who is uh, coming in the name of Jesus Christ into our lives will bring us to become like this. This is like on-the-job training. We are doing it as we follow Jesus through all sorts of situations. We don't become fishers of men by ourselves. We don't make ourselves become fishers of men. It's the work of God. It's supernatural. It's divine. It is Jesus doing a, a work in us. When we first come to the Lord Jesus, we come to Him with a calling. There's a calling in the gospel, a calling to become a fisherman. And, but because we are new to doing that, we feel sometimes overwhelmed, we feel insecure, we feel incompetent, and we don't know how. And usually because of that f kind of feeling, we kind of excuse ourselves and we kind of don't give ourselves to the becoming of, of a fisherman. We kind of step out of that. It's kind of we excuse ourselves that this is a calling of God for each Christian. It's not, it should not be an option. Okay, not for me. It should not be regarded like this. It is Jesus calling all his disciples in the same way. You follow me, I will make you become a fisherman. And when the heart is receptive to the 
teaching of Jesus Christ, you will be transformed and you will be anointed and God will do the impossible, the miraculous catch. That's the picture that we, we, we stopped with last week. There's a miraculous catch if Jesus does it. It's not you. You may have tried. You may have failed. Uh, you, may be, you, you think that people will not come into your net because their heart is too hard, because they are not interested in the gospel. Uh, you know, we, we think all kind of things about people, how they will not accept us. They will not accept our, and then we excuse ourselves. But Jesus is proving to us again, you just follow me and throw your net deeper, cast your net again with me and the boat. And Jesus will do something miraculous, unexpected. And this hope, this faith, this is part of faith. Since I believe in Jesus, I believe that Jesus can do everything, but I don't believe that Jesus can use me to evangelize. Is that the faith that we have? Because I've tried and I failed before. No, faith says, I desire. I want to see that happening. I want to experience miraculous catching of fish in my life. And this is possible. Why can I see it's possible? Because Jesus said it is. Amen? And this is my faith, and it should be your faith this morning. So this morning, what we are going to do, we are learning to fish. We are going to learn to fish by following Jesus and learning along. Jesus was the best fish catcher. He was the best fisherman. He showed it to Peter. And uh, uh, we will look at how Jesus was catching men. How did Jesus treat people? How did Jesus relate to people? How did he draw people to the kingdom of God? And then we will learn from him. And if we do like him, because when Jesus says, follow me, means come after me, come close to me, follow me and imitate me, observe me, know from me, receive my teaching. So if I, if I walk along with Jesus in the New Testament and I see his heart and I see how he relates to people and then I say, yes, Lord, I, I, I'm learning from you and this is how I need to change my, my view. I need to change my, my ways. I need to change how I relate to people in the same way. I will be catching fish. Amen? I will be catching men, actually, more than fish. Hallelujah. First text, we want to look at here. How Jesus regards people. It's in Mark chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. We have so many texts that we could look, so I've only selected a few this morning, to show that as we follow Jesus Christ, as the disciples follow Jesus, they had to relearn something. They had to learn how to uh, look at people. And here we have this, this, the story of a man with a withered hand. And uh, people in the synagogue were watching Jesus. Why were they watching Jesus? To learn from him? To be uh, in wonder of his greatness and his ability to perform miracles? No, their motives were so bad so that they might accuse him because he would do something good for someone on a day according to their tradition and their religious uh, custom it would not be allowed to do something good you have to do nothing you do nothing don't move don't walk don't go anywhere uh, don't make any effort uh, don't cook uh, don't buy any grocery, don't do anything. That, that's what's supposed to happen. And Jesus there to do something good for somebody in need, somebody desperate. And so we see in this story the contrast between how religious, the religious leaders l regard people and how Jesus regard people. And we see that the, the, these people were indignated they, they, they couldn't accept that Jesus could do such a, such a thing on the, and they had, their heart was so, so hard. And then um, Jesus asked them a question, is it allowed, according to the law, to do something good on a day like the Sabbath? And of course it is, because these people were hypocrites. We read in other texts that Jesus is calling them hypocrites, he says, you take your ox and you take your donkey yourself to drink on the Sabbath day. And me, I cannot do something good. Like he said that 
when he healed this old lady who was bent over, uh, disabled by the, the demon that possessed her for 18 years. And they, they were so uh, angry at Jesus. And they said to this lady, come another day of the week to be healed. Don't come on the Sabbath day as if this lady could have gone on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday and these people would have healed her. They didn't care, but they cared only about themselves. They care about their religious uh, ceremonies. They care about their custom. They care about their donkeys because the donkey belonged to me. But they don't care about a lady that has been suffering that has been uh, under the, the demon uh, oppression for 18 years. They didn't care about it. But Jesus is showing us that we have to care. And here we see how Jesus was angry. We see two uh, emotions expressed from Jesus here. Angry. He was really angry. He was distressed to see such a indifference. More than indifference, the word hardness here is Kalushness. It's like the it's like heartlessness. They did not have a heart. They were insensitive. They were not interested. They showed no sympathy and, and, and not a trace of sympathy. And Jesus was grieved. How, how is it possible that people will be so insensitive when there are needs, when people have needs? And Jesus as they were following Jesus in, in their ministry, in the Jesus ministry, they could learn and see what is ministry, how Jesus is loving, how Jesus cares, how he regards people. Following Jesus removes the blindness over our hearts because the word hardness of hearts here also include a form of blindness you don't see things the right way you don't see the need of that person you don't see with with a heart that is open and really have any form of sympathy or or understanding for what this person is going through these people were blind their heart was so close so that's why following jesus when you follow jesus the the blindness of your heart the hardness of your heart will will melt and you will become to feel like jesus you will become to see what's important to jesus you know jesus says to his disciple in the book of john chapter 14 he says you look at me you know the father you look at Jesus Christ, how he behaves, you understand the mercy of God. You understand the love of God. You understand the interest of God. Another text we are going to look at is the one woman in John chapter 8. The woman caught with another man that is not her husband, and she's been accused. And I want to look just at the later part of that text. Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, after they all walked away, because they were all there with their stone, ready to stone them. And then Jesus wrote in the sand, you know the story. And then whatever he wrote, we are not sure. But it had an impact. And their conscience, were, they were really convicted. And just as anyone who has never sinned threw the first stone. And then one by one, they walked away. It says, where are your accusers? Did, didn't even one of them condemn you? They were a crowd accusing her. And now there's not even one condemning her and Jesus says neither do I go and sin no more then he says this amazing statement because this story doesn't finish there most of the time we stop the story there go and sin no more but Jesus after this scene just took place turns and he's going now to illustrate it he's going to teach more about what the event that just took place and this is what he says I am the light of the world if you follow me, again we find that, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Okay, so why does Jesus say that just after this event? This lady was accused, the, those who condemn her walk away, and then Jesus says, I don't condemn you, go and sin no more. And then he turns to the crowd that is still standing around, the, the witnesses. And then he says, I'm the light of the world. If you follow me, you will not walk in the darkness. Where was the darkness in that situation? The darkness was in the hearts of the accusers. 
they didn't know what they are doing. They were not, you know, they were the religious leaders. They were supposedly um, ministering to God or preserving the faith, uh, doing something, uh, you know, to honor God by killing this lady. You, you, see, you see the darkness here? You see how religion can do horrible things? People kill themselves. They are kamikaze because, you know, they want to honor their God or whatever. People do all sorts of things in the name of religion. Look in the history of this world. You will see atrocities done in the name of a God or even in the name of Christianity at some point. So there is darkness. So Jesus says, when you follow me, this darkness will be removed. You will learn progressively to walk into something new. You will learn to see. You will, you will not be blind anymore. The light will be with you. When you have the light, what does the light do? The light enlightens the heart. Yeah, that's what it does. And the light, what it did, revealed the darkness in the heart of the accusers, and one by one, they walked away because the light brought conviction over their dark. And then they saw, I'm, I'm a sinner. If you have never sinned through the stone, and the light of Jesus came and brought light into their hearts, and they walked away. Another thing that happened with the light, as you and I, we follow Jesus Christ, we learn progressively to walk in the light. We learn progressively to interpret people, events, and situations in a different way. The light enables us to do that. The light enables us to see more clearly into people's needs and to people's situations. Uh, the light enables us to have discernment, uh, to, to judge situation and people differently. And uh, we can look in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 and verse 15 to illustrate that truth, what the light of Jesus Christ does to us. In 1 Corinthians 2, 14, the natural man, the man without the Spirit of God, who is not a disciple yet, not born again, does not receive, understand the things of the Spirit of God. But look at verse uh, 215, chapter 215. Whoever has the Spirit, however, is able to judge the value of everything. You can judge of a situation differently because the Spirit of God is you. You, you find different value system in interpreting situations and people and the need of the people. Uh, another version says that you, you can evaluate all things. Those who are spiritual can evaluate all things. You are able to evaluate and judge the value of something in a different way. And this is the role of the Holy Spirit. That's why you and I, we need to follow Jesus. This is something we learn. This is essential that we learn these things if we want to become fishers of man. Because these are relating us to the people, how we regard people. If I think of myself like superior to these sinners, I'm not going to win any of them to the Lord. How, how do I regard people who have needs, people who are you know, in sin, or people who show hardness of heart around me? They are blind. I need to see that blindness. I need to, to discern the conditions of these people. Another text, Levi and his friends, Matthew 9, starting in verse 9. As Jesus was walking along, he called Matthew, who was a tax collector. He says, follow me and be my disciple. Then Matthew got up and followed him. But Matthew invited Jesus, now his new friend, to meet with all of his group of friends. Of course, Matthew's friends were not the best people to, to be around. Uh, they were uh, people just like him, publicans and sinners we read in the Bible. But here in this Bible version says, this disreputable sinners, people with bad reputations, bad behavior, people who had the bad names and the community, all this. And the Pharisees look at these people and even go further, they call them the scum, like the, 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 the lowest, the, the, 
not worth it to be, you don't want to soil yourself by associating with so, so bad people. So they are scum. When Jesus heard this, he says, healthy people don't need the doctor, sick people do. Now go and learn the meaning of these scriptures. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices, for I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. And here, another lesson that we need to see. The Pharisees regard people like they are separated from these people. You know, I'm, I'm out there. And it is possible that after years of being Christian, we disassociate ourselves from what we were when Christ came into our life. Because now we, we know the righteousness of God. We know what the Bible says, what is holy, what is, should be pure and everything. And then we see in society so many people who are ungodly and wicked and we see so much evil. And it is possible that we start to distance ourselves, elevate ourselves in a higher position, and then not be able to communicate with these sinners anymore. And we have to be careful that this is not happening to us. That's why we need to be fishers of men. That's why we need to be always ready, always involved in sharing our faith, because that creates a connection with people no matter how they, how they are. Verse 13, Jesus gave them a lesson, and this lesson is our lesson to learn as well. Go and learn the meaning of these scriptures. And these scriptures is the expression of the heart of God. This is what God really thinks as important. You see, many of us, we look at our Christian life I'm faithful. I go to church. I pay my tithe. I sing the songs. I have uh, a ministry in the church or whatever, a form of religion that I'm practicing weekly, monthly, whatever, for a so, for number of years. But Jesus says, I'm not interested in the form of your religion. I'm interested in you you're living out the life and you're uh, representing me to people and to, uh, you know, how you treat people like God would treat people. Go and learn this lesson, the meaning of the scriptures. And this is from uh, Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, the scriptures. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifice. Uh, I, Hosea says it like this, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. God is not you know, just want a burnt offering. So you bring your offering, your burnt offering to the temple, but during the rest of the week, you show no mercy, you are angry, you, you treat people badly, you, you have a bad mouth, your heart is filled with jealousy, envy, and you, there, there's no love, forgiveness, there's no mercy in your life. God is not interested in this burnt sacrifice at all. So that's why Jesus says, I want you to learn that lesson. Learn to interpret scriptures like it is. So following Jesus does that in our lives. We have to reinterpret what is really important and, 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 and to the eyes of God. And then Jesus uh, brings it clearly because he says that God desires that the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. We need to learn to know God. We need to learn to know Jesus, Jesus' heart, Jesus' intention, Jesus' purpose, Jesus' mission. And here he says it so clearly, For I have come to call not those who think that they are righteous, but those who know that they are sinners. That's the people that Jesus came to contact, to save, to bring to God, to reconcile. So now you and I, we have to do likewise. As we follow Jesus, we have to learn these lessons. Jesus is compassionate. Another text that is very significant, Luke 9, 53 to 56. They were going to Jerusalem, passing through Samaria, and Jesus had sent them ahead of him to prepare his coming. And these people in that particular village did not welcome Jesus. They didn't want to have anything to do with uh, Jesus. And the disciples were very offended. These people were so rude. These people uh, that didn't show any love. They didn't show any hospitality. What kind of people are they? So uh, Peter and John says, 
Lord, should we call down fire from heaven and burn them up? These people are useless. They, you know, we, we have to do something about that. And you know, look at Peter and John. They were called by Jesus. How long at that moment have they been walking with Jesus? A, s a number of months, uh, a year or more or something, or two years or something like this, uh, maybe almost three years. They had been walking with Jesus, but they still had this kind of attitude. They still had this kind of heart. You say, but not me. Me, I, I've passed that, that level anymore. Okay, let me, let, me explain. <laughs> let me explain to you sometimes how I feel. I live in a village traditional village and we have neighbors and uh, neighbors they have dogs and they don't care if the dog barks all day all night you know they're just doing and sometimes my Christian you know <laughs> personality disappear <laughs> and my imagination replaced this with feelings of Revenge. Sometimes I would. Uh, what could I do to this dog? Uh, what could I do to this uh, the the owner of these dogs? Uh, should I call the police? Uh, you know, I have to do something to take the, this ugly situation. These inconsiderate neighbors. They are rude. You go in the store. How many of you have been frustrated in the store before with the owner, or the shop owners? How many of you have been frustrated to see people cutting you in the train and entertaining thoughts of anger? You know, sometimes, I, I'm sorry to confess that to you, <laughs> sometimes I find myself, like I, I discover, I, I'm walking on the street and I'm angry. I'm angry at the people. <laughs> you know, I, I'm walking like this, and then suddenly, if this, if I realize it, then I, I want to correct that. Lord, I'm here. I, I'm a missionary. <laughs> I cannot uh, hate everybody and you know be angry at, at everybody. That's not right. So change my heart. But am I the only one here? <laughs> no. Okay. Okay. So then you you want to confess too. Oh, that is really bad. That's worse than me. That's worse than me. Oh, oh. But you've never done that. Huh? And you wouldn't do it either. No, no, yes. You ju it just came to you, your imagination. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So, we can associate with these two disciples, James and John, can we? Yes. Can you associate with them? Yes. So, what does Jesus tell them? And he, he turned and he rebuked them. So that's important for you and I to follow Jesus because as we f you know, behave like this or think like this or imagine all kinds of evil scenario against people, Jesus can address us by his spirit in and, and, uh, and our lives. And then he says to us, he can rebuke, you don't realize what your hearts are like. And many times we don't realize and the Spirit of God needs to do this work in us. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy people, but to save them. This needs to be repeated over and over and over again. You know why? Because let's say that this situation with the shopkeeper that I was angry with last week, I, I overcame that with a good Christian attitude last week okay I, I was overcomer of that one and I controlled my emotions and I focused on the Spirit of God and I reminded myself I'm a Christian and a pastor and a missionary so I must behave uh, you know with love and be polite and everything so that is last week but that week this week I still have to face similar people and situations. So following Jesus is not only last week, but it is this week, it is next week, it is next month, it is in all sorts of situations. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy people's lives, but to save them. You and I, we need to learn that. And we need to apply that. How many of you, don't raise your hands, because there were too many hands, especially those who are domestic helpers, 
How many of you have been angry at your employer? And, 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 and a similar way, this week, this very week. Yes, yes, yes. So you understand that, okay? So you don't realize what your hearts are like. Jesus came not to destroy people's life, but to save them. Oh, this is hard. Jesus came to save people like the ones that hurt you this week? Yes, he did. He did. He did. Uh, many of you will remember the American uh, family who were uh, captured by the Abu Sayyaf in the Philippines. And maybe you read this book, and if you haven't, you should read it. Martin and Gracia Bur Burnham. Mm -hmm. For a year and a half, they were dragged barefoot, uh, almost clothesless in the jungles of the Philippines and Mindanao, shot at and all of this, tied to a tree. They couldn't go to the bathroom and all of this. And during the negotiation at times when people in the U.S., they were trying to raise funds or send some love gift to them to comfort them, you know, when they were there, sometimes they would receive love gifts in the jungle of Mindanao. And they would be like chocolate or they would be, you know, different kinds of things in the box that they would receive. And guess what happened? The Abu Sayyaf, they would eat the chocolate. <laughs> You know, this, this is little things, it's little things. But then, this was for you the only comfort, the only positive things, these connections with the free world, like giving you hope that maybe you will get out of that situation, and you capture, they take it, and they destroy it, and they despise it, and then they give you the empty box. And sometimes, Martin and uh, Gracia, they were talking to each other and surprised to discover their hate, their desire for vengeance, and this hatred that they would feel for these ungodly, wicked people. You know, when they were in the jungle, they witnessed people having their head cut. By the, you know, these people were bad people. Yeah, they were bad people. And they were, you know, they had to relate. They were missionary. You know, when they were taken captive, the wife organized um, an okay, uh, uh, anniversary holiday in Palawan, in one of the safe resorts there. That's where they were supposed to be. 5.30 in the morning, boat came, shots were being killed, uh, sh and they were taken on boats, 20, 20 uh, uh, people together, and taken in the, in the jungle. At the end of the story, her husband, just at the moment that they were being rescued by the Philippine army, the husband was killed right in front of her. And she came out of that. But you think of people like this and the kind of mind that they have. And you know, when, they, when you read the book, I was touched many times because when they were feeling hatred, with good reason, we will see, uh, all, all of us, we would understand and sympathize with them, but they repented. And he says, no, it's not right. We are Christian. We are missionary. God sent us to this country. And he allowed us to be with these people. How can we, you know, bring Jesus to them or reflect Jesus to them? And they repented in such a contact. So, and that shows us one of the ultimate example, Jesus Christ himself on the cross. And you, you read it in Luke chapter 23 when they crucified him, they nailed him to the cross, and the criminals were crucified, one on his right and one on his left, and Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. Following Jesus is important for us, because we see. You know, this is one of the ugliest texts of the old Bible, because as Jesus was dying of this excruciating pain, the worst kind of death, the most humiliating death of all, people were scoffing, laughing, mocking. This is impossible. This is an impossible emotion that is described there, but it is the reality. That is human nature. The same human nature that you and I are capable of. You know, this lack of mercy, this hardness of heart, this insensitivity. 
And we as disciples are to take up our cross daily, just like Jesus says, deny ourselves and follow him. If we don't, Jesus says, you are not worthy to be my disciple. What Jesus did on this cross there, the example, the supreme example, he says, you are expected to deal, to deal with people in the same way. With the most wicked and evil people, you are expected by Jesus Christ to deal and behave in the same way as he did. And Stephen did it in Acts chapter 7, verse 59 and 60. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees and pain. The stones were being poured over his body. Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. He followed Jesus. And he became a fisher of men. And his death, his first convert, was his persecutor, the Apostle Paul. The blood of Stephen brought the Apostle Paul to the Lord. And you can read that in the book of Acts. And I want to look at uh, John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman. You know, that conversation that took place between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And then the disciples went away to buy some foods. They came back and it says, uh, verse 27, they were shocked to find him talking to a woman. This is here an example of following Jesus to overcome religious prejudices, racial prejudices, and cultural prejudices. A woman and a man, that's a cultural, a Samaritan and uh, Jewish people that is both religious and uh, racial as well. What They didn't dare to ask any questions. So then Jesus goes on. He says, I have a food to eat that you do not understand. There are many things in the kingdom of God that we do not understand until we follow as apprentices the skillful master and learn the trade from him by walking closely to him. That's why we must become this kind of uh, disciple. I have a food to eat that you cannot understand what it is. Is there something in the kingdom of God this morning that you cannot understand at this point of your life, of your Christian life? Something that would turn you into a more effective Christian a more effective, a person that would glorify Jesus more, a bolder person in situation and sharing the gospel and the love of Jesus and reflecting. Is there something you haven't read uh, yet understood? That's what Jesus is telling them about. My food is to do the will of him who sent me to accomplish his work. Do, not, do you not say, here people we have are saying, there are yet four months, then comes the harvest. You know, I still have time. I'm too young. I can do it later. I can do it like there's still time to bring people in the kingdom of God. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes right now and see there's always an harvest. There's always an harvest. You think there's not an harvest around you in your office and your place of work or in your school. There's no harvest. Look and you will see. Follow Jesus, look with the eyes of Jesus, you will see there is an harvest. And I will come to an example, of, I'm, I want to go a bit uh, further on that and this principle. There is an harvest. Last week I introduced to you my, one of my best friends, Daniel, who is a skillful uh, fisherman. So I want to come back to Daniel because this very week I received this strange email and I wasn't sure if it was spam or something like that. Then when I, I received three emails, and uh, then I saw Bridget and Renee on it. So I said, okay, it looks like genuine. And then finally I see a picture of something. Let's, let's put the, the PowerPoint on that. How to become good fishermen, okay? That's, we are going to look at real fishermen in order to apply some spiritual principle to us this morning. Let's go look to the next one. So when I opened the email, I saw my friend Daniel, this is him, Daniel, the one I was telling you that he is, I use the word crazy, not that he is crazy, but that he is crazy about fishing. He loves fishing so much. He is way out there on some of the land I was describing to you last week where he has to go by either by 
uh, there's no road or you know like you can go by plane or some kind of thing he's very far away he's with his wife and he is catching these fish he was showing it and they had included in this uh, email also a, sh a short video taken like a very cheap quality and they were in the zodiac boat they were fishing and he was filming his wife who was cooking in the boat the fish that they just got <laughs> really and she looked so peaceful and <laughs> And then she was taking her fork and showing the, the fish to, you know, like this. So they are catching 24 inches fish, you know, and all the kind of things like this. And this is the best fish. And uh, he has all sorts of experience. So I want, you know, many times when we illustrate the Christian life, we use athletes. Uh, to The athletes is, you know, we need to be like athletes. So this morning I want to say we need to be like fishermen. We need to be like Daniel. If you would know him, he's the perfect example of what I want to talk about. He's completely sold out to hunting, trapping, and fishing. He's, that's what he likes to do. He's retired. He used to be a contractor in construction. So he's, he purchased, and, and, and this video is filming around showing the scenery. And he says, this is near our camp, near the beaver dam you know it's way out there in the, the bush so let's look to the next one here how to become good fishermen these advice here are from a skillful world-renowned fisherman who has been fishing for 47 years I was searching on the internet you know some tips how to become good fishermen and this is and you will see these principles apply so well to our spiritual life Persistence, determination, dedication to details, and focus. This is what you and I need to do with our Christian life. Getting the right equipment, you know, it costs a lot to be a good fisherman. He's got a boat, he, you know, he's buying a land, he's going by plane to go, you know, fishing somewhere and all of the, 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 the fishing rods and the, the, the things, the, the bait and all, all of this. For years, they have been investing. They had a mobile home even to go to some very remote place. So to become that kind, like Danielle's skillful fisherman, years of experience, of dedication, of investment and all of this experience skills sharpens through practice with a bit of trial and error involved in the process of eliminating what doesn't work and what does you have to go out there and try some ways to re relate to people and share the gospel sometimes something you will do will work sometimes will not work but with years you will learn more what will work then continue to learn one of the advice is read everything you can get your hands on from the experts isn't that what we're supposed to read who is the expert fisherman Jesus Christ, read everything you can get your hands on from the experts, great Christians in the history of the church. Learn from the evangelists, learn from people, the missionaries, read biographies, be inspired. Learn, uh, learn what they have done and try to imitate them. Then after that in the articles, he mentioned many, many world-renowned great fishermen that appeared on TV. Then he, this man added, every one of them had these attributes in their life. They had these attributes. And then he says, someone who puts in his time and really dedicates himself should eventually become a good fisherman. You want to become a good fisherman? Give time and dedicate yourself, and eventually you will become. And that goes for every one of us here in our, in, in our Christian life. Some go out fishing whenever they have nothing else to do. Well, maybe tomorrow, maybe someday. You don't put the heart in it. But others focus on it intently, and in the long run, long run they learn things the guy on the couch doesn't. Remember last week I talked about the guy on the couch watching his soccer uh, team losing and complaining about him, but he's still sitting on the couch and he's not doing anything to participate in two days team winning or something. Here's the same thing. You want to learn fishing for Jesus Christ? You cannot learn it on the couch. You have to go out there and do something. Second uh, uh, 
PowerPoint. Definition of great fisherman. A great fisherman is consistent and catch fish or find fish in a wide variety of situation. So that is as Christian. He also doesn't give up or quit. Have you quit? Are you able to think creatively? He can find fish just by doing a quick scan of the water. I was telling you last week, Daniel is doing that. He was telling me this summer. He goes on the river, he looks at the shadow, the tree, you know, the, thing, the, 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 the angle of the sun, and he knows where the, fish, where the fish are. That type of knowledge is gained from putting a lot of hours into fishing. You want to learn to fish for Jesus? Do the same. He understands the habits of the species of fish that he's trying to catch. You need to know your fish. You need to know your fish. He can read conditions and weather and doesn't hesitate as where he has to go next. Good days, bad days, rain or not, it's time to go and catch a fish. And he does it. A great fisherman takes chances on nights. Others stay home and learn something in the process. A great fisherman puts in his time and does not complain about it. And the, 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 the very good one here. A great fisherman doesn't have to say a word. His fish will speak for him. Mm -hmm. eh? The fish that you bring in the gospel, through the gospel in the kingdom of God will speak for you of your ministry. So follow Jesus in the last one. Follow Jesus and he will make you become fishers of man. Hallelujah. And quickly, I will not, I have more, but I will stop with one text because I cannot not read it. It's in Matthew 13 verse 47 and 48 because there's a direct uh, connection between this verse and what we're talking about. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a fishing net that was thrown into the water and caught fish of every kind. When the net was full, they dragged it up onto the shore, sat down and sorted the good fish into crates, but threw the bad ones away. Why is it important to become fishers of men? Because Jesus says that picture is, this is the way it will be at the end of the world. The text continues. The angels will come. They will sort out. They will, those who do not fit will be thrown in the fiery furnace where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then a question is being asked to his disciple after he says all of this. Do you understand these things? Am I asking you the question this morning? Do you understand these things? They says, yes, we do. They says, yes, we do. Then he says, okay, if you understand that, then go and do it. And then he talks about the, uh, every teacher of religious law who becomes a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like a homeowner who brings from his treasure or storeroom new gems of truth as well as old. So we have this picture here, if you understand that, that the kingdom of God is like going fishing, throwing the net and dragging the net, and there will be at one point, I mean, we're talking eternity here. There is a picture that there is two choice. One kind of fish goes into the harvest that is produced for eternal life. That is something I did not read, but it is in John chapter 4, verse 36, but I skipped it. But it says that the rewards of the, the workers, the workers are receiving their reward by gathering a harvest that brings eternal life. So when the net is being thrown and people are fishing for God, the fish are being pulled in. Some fish are too small or useless or whatever. They will be thrown in the fiery furnace for eternity. That's hell. The other one, they are being harvested. Are people harvest? They, they say it here. That brings eternal life. Or the harvest, they, um, they are, people are brought to eternal life. That's, that's why we fish. One group of fish goes to people who are brought into eternal life. Another one goes to the fiery furnace. That's why we need to fish. And just as the, someone who is a disciple in the kingdom of God understands that and goes on fishing, 
and wants to become a fisher of men because there is eternity, there is judgment, and there is salvation. And the act of fishing produced by your, your ability to fish. So all of us should be running on our, on our knees to Jesus Christ as Lord, I really am in need to learn how to fish. That's what should be our response. Because we ourselves have experienced salvation. So where are you casting your net? Where have you been casting your net? Or where will you be casting your net? And how will you be casting your net? Let's stand this morning. Hallelujah.